Well, if you guys could turn to Philippians chapter 4. Uh, last time we were together, we were in chapter 3, dealing with joy in believing. And we saw that we should have great joy in believing that our good works um, are as rubbish, like Paul said, right? We cannot become righteous in and of our own self and our own good works, but it was through the righteousness of Christ Jesus uh, and what he accomplished there on the cross for you and I uh, that made us righteous. And, and so it's by faith, right? And so in fact, Paul listed a bunch of his good works and said, hey, if anybody has good works, I, I would have it more so. But uh, nonetheless, you know, it's, it, it's accounted as loss, as, as trash, right? Uh, compared to Christ and his righteousness. And, and so uh, since none of that can make him righteous. So he also said we have great joy in believing that our citizenship is in heaven. And, and what a day that's going to be when we get to see Jesus face to face. It's going to be amazing. Uh, so if you're there with me in Philippians chapter 4, uh, let's go ahead and read in verse 1 all the way to verse 9. It says, Therefore, my beloved and longed for brethren, my joy and crown, so stand fast in the Lord, beloved. I implore Yoda and implore Syntyche to be of the same mind in the Lord. And I urge you also, true companion, help these women who labored with me in the gospel, with Clement also and the rest of my fellow workers whose names are in the book of life. Rejoice in the Lord always. Again, I say, I will say rejoice. Let your gentleness be known to all men. The Lord is at hand. Be anxious for nothing, but in everything, by prayer and supplication, with thanksgiving, let your requests be made known to God. And the peace of God, which surpasses all understanding, will guard your hearts and minds through Christ Jesus. And finally, brethren, whatever things are true, whatever things are noble, whatever things are just, whatever things are pure, whatever things are lovely, whatever things are of good report, if there's any virtue, and if, if there's anything praiseworthy, meditate on these things. The things which you learned and received and heard and saw in me, these do, and the God of peace will be with you all. Amen. I feel like I have to pray again on that one. Um, so intro, the, these uh, nine verses we see here are all about joy in believing. If you guys got a little handout thing, you guys could follow along too. But uh, joy in believing what? Joy in believing that all of our cares, all of our concerns, all of our conflicts, we just we give it all to Jesus in our prayers. And, and since we know he gives that peace, you know, that surpasses all understanding. And, and that, that peace guards our minds and our hearts toward Christ Jesus. And it, truly there's joy in giving it all to him. And in 1 Peter chapter 5, uh, verse 7, it says, Casting all your care upon him, for he cares for you. And, and we'll see, when we cast all our care on the Lord... Uh, then there will be joy and there will be peace from the Lord. And, and that's what Paul's dealing with here, the idea of true peace. And in uh, verse 7, he talks about the peace of God. And then in verse 9, he's talking about the God of peace. And so people today, they're looking for this peace, this tranquility, if you will. And their, their, their world is upside down. And the sad thing is, people are looking for this peace in all the wrong places. Uh, they're looking in uh, for, you know, peace in people and prestige and power and um, popularity, thinking somehow, you know, if I attain to this or get that or then I'll have peace, you know, and, and uh, what peace they would have, you know. But I'm here to tell you guys, that it's all temporary. You know, those things are good and great and they're wonderful, and they're, they're, but they only last so long. You know, you put your, your trust in man, but man fades away. You know, uh, popularity fades away. Or we're, it, It's like old cars, right? They, you, there's, there's the new cars will always be old cars and people, you know, pass away, fashions change, things change. And, and true peace only comes through Jesus Christ and him alone. Amen? Amen. 
Amen. So eight things I want to go over with you guys tonight uh, involving this true peace that we have. Number one, it involves the perseverance Paul requires. The perseverance that Paul requires. Notice in verse one, it says, Therefore, my beloved and long for brethren, my joy and crown, so stand fast in the Lord, beloved. So Paul mentions his love for the church of Philippi. Did you guys notice that? Twice here in verse 1. And, and this word stand fast, by the way, it means to persevere, to be persistent, to keep on keeping on, we would say. And, and it's a word used uh, uh, like a military word, to stand fast, right? Stand, uh, stand fast. Whoever, you know, you hold your ground in spite of the track record that the enemy has in, in their you know, the, they're, they're murdering, you know, a whole bunch of people and then and, and they're coming across the line with you and, and you're told, stand fast, you know. And so no matter what the enemy is doing around you, you're to hold your ground. You're to stand fast. And, and uh, Paul is telling us to stand firm, persevere in that sense, right? And it's a command, by the way. It's not an option. You as a believer are commanded to stand fast and, and stand fast knowing what? Knowing that our citizenship is in heaven in the context here. And note the word in verse 1, by the way, therefore. This word links the previous section to chapter 3, verses 20 and 21, speaking of our citizenship that's in heaven. And, and since our lowly bodies will be transformed, to, and I guess you can say conform to his glorious body, right? So we are to stand fast. We are to persevere. We are to patiently uh, uh, per be persistent, basically. And, and know carefully, by the way, that this word persistence is based on the future promise of glory, not on our, uh, our present circumstances and our present situations that we're going through. That's just like, whoa, that's, that's great to hear. Our persistence in standing our ground uh, in, in spite of the onslaught of the enemy is based on the future promise of glory by Jesus Christ. So it's not based on our situation. It's not based on our circumstances, uh, but it's based on Jesus. And one day we'll be in heaven. We're going to have our glorified bodies. We're going to see Jesus face to face. You guys, we're, we're uh, registered citizens of heaven, not here on earth. And, and uh, one day we're going to be given this, uh, we're going to trade in our old body for this new glorious body that, that God has uh, preserved for you and I. Uh, he's going he's gonna to transform it at that time. In fact, the Bible says in 1 Corinthians 15, 53, for this corruptible must put on incorruption and this mortal must put on immortality so when this corruptible has put on incorruption and this mortal has put on immortality then shall be brought to pass the saying that is written death is swallowed up in victory that's awesome so know carefully by the way that our perseverance our our steadfastness uh, is rooted in Jesus Christ himself. And, and notice in verse 1 in the middle, it says, So stand fast in who? In the Lord, beloved. So our steadfastness is in Christ Jesus alone. Am I going too fast for you guys? So we take a little Selah moment. Okay, let's go. So notice it's in, it's in him, right? We have strength, we have perseverance, and it's not something that we work at or strive for. Uh, Zechariah 4.6 says what? Not by might nor by power, but by my spirit, says the Lord. And so when we understand that being steadfast is in the Lord, in his promises of, uh, or in his promise of future glory and what lies ahead, now all of a sudden, when the trials come into our lives, and by the way, when and not if right they're gonna come and and uh we're not gonna waver to the right or to the left right or to the right to the left there you go but why because our eyes are fixed on jesus and the future hope that we have in christ jesus right and and it's all about what lies ahead and looking forward and pressing forward uh keeping our eyes hebrews 12 2 um on jesus right um, I was talking to, to Donna in the back earlier, and uh, we were talking about psychology. And, and uh, it's funny because what's the idea of is, oh, so tell me how your life was. Oh, how, what happened in the past? And, and they want you to look deep in, in the past and keep your eyes in the past. 
And but what is what does the Bible say, right? When you're reading it, it's always looking forward, pressing in, going, you know, looking at who? Jesus. Not looking at yourself, right? What happens when you look at yourself? Well, I'll tell you what happens when I look at myself, right? You get depressed, right? And you get sad. And uh, I don't know, you might be getting all happy. I don't know. But, um, but we shouldn't be looking at ourselves. That's why a lot of psychology is very dangerous, especially in the church. We've got to be watchful for that. Um, but keeping our eyes fixed on Jesus. He's the author and the finisher of our faith. Um, but our problem is that we get our eyes off of the future glory and onto our current circumstances when the Bible says in 2 Corinthians 4.18, while we do not look at the things which are seen, but at the things which are not seen. For the things which are seen are temporary, but the things which are not seen are eternal. So keep having that heavenly perspective, if you will, right? Paul says that we're going to go through, what we're going through right now is a momentary light affliction, right? It's not heavy, it's a light affliction. Uh, and, and it's compared to, our, you know, our uh, eternal glory that we have, you know, awaiting us. And so remember, Phil, uh, uh, Paul is encouraging the church of Philippi because what's going to happen in 64 AD, Nero, he burnt Rome on fire, blamed it on the Christians, and began persecuting the Christians. The Church of Philippi doesn't know this yet, right? They're receiving this letter, and it's, it's, it's all about joy, the joy of the Lord. But as you're reading it, you can see that hidden message throughout the entire book of that urgency to keep your eyes focused on Jesus. What's going to happen to the majority of the church when persecution comes on? A lot of people are going to run away. They're, they can't handle it. They don't want to mature in persecution right now because when that fire comes on and it gets heated up, they're, they're out of there. They're like, Whoa! Then you understand uh, it's the, the true exposure happens to the, the church, right, where, where the, the wolves run and they abandon the sheep. And there's, there's a lot of stuff that's really tough uh, when happens when trials come our way and tends all that stuff. So uh, no doubt Nero was demon possessed, but Paul, what is he doing? He's rallying the believers together and, and to wake them up and get them ready because it's, it's going to get heated up, right? It's going to get, the stuff is going to happen and suffering is coming their way. And, and Paul is encouraging the church of Philippi to continue to look onto the Lord because there's a danger when you look to self then when the winds of doctrine come your way, you're easily going to be taken by the winds that come your way of, of so-and-so, knocks on your door, right? Guess what? There's a new revelation. No way. <laughs> Who told you? An angel of the Lord. Oh, really? And if you don't know the Bible, what's going to happen? You're going to get taken with that wind of doctrine. But when you know the Bible, you're like, wait a minute. The Bible says, you know, even if an angel comes to me, I'm not going to receive it. In fact, the Bible even says I shouldn't even let you in my house. So why don't you stay out there, you know? And, uh, but grow in the word of God. And, and Paul is encouraging the church of Philippi right here. Uh, if you guys could catch this, uh, it's, it's subtle, but it's there. And uh, let's come to the second thing. Uh, the problem Paul mentions. The, the problem Paul mentions. Look at verse 2. Uh, it says... I implore Yoda and I implore Syntyche, I don't know how to pronounce their names, but that's how it's going to be, to be of the same mind in the Lord. Um, so the problem Paul mentions, he's talking about two things. Number one is the lack of unity, according to verse 2, and he's also talking about the need for help in verse 3. And now let's look at verse 2, the lack of unity. Now we got these two women right here, and there's something going on, but notice he says uh, implore which means beg, it means besiege, it means to call near, to urgently ask, to exhort you, to admonish. And, and there was some problems in the church of Philippi. I know that sounds, uh, sounds kind of weird, huh, that there's problems in the church. That's uh, familiar, right? Um, but there was disunity in the church, even back then, obviously today, right? There's lots of problems in the churches. Um, but we, we do know that there was a problem with these two women. We don't know what the problem actually was, but we know that it was causing 
uh, division in a sense. And Paul's urging them to, that they need unity. And they were, they were uh, disagreeing about something, but Paul encouraged them, hey guys, be of the same mind, right? Paul understood the importance of um, unity and peace. And he knew that without unity, that there would be no peace. And Paul brings up two, these two girls as examples in, in uh, giving us that correlation between the lack of unity and the lack of peace. And Paul often talks about having the same mind. Um, Philippians 1.27, Philippians 2.2, 2, Philippians 3.16. He's talking about being of the same mind. And if we're of the same mind, then we will, there, there'll, be, there'll be peace. There'll be rest. There'll be tranquility, if you will. And, and Paul's counsel, them, counsel to them was, hey, both of you guys be of the same mind in Christ Jesus. And, and the problem starts when, you know, we try in our flesh to be, uh, really to be thinking our way is better, right? That's, that's the problem of the flesh is I, I'm, I'm better than you are. And, and uh, not to say that all of us have to always be in the same mind, uh, there's differences, of course, right? But uh, it's okay to disagree on issues, uh, but when it comes to the essential doctrine of the word of God, according to our faith, the essential doctrine of our faith, uh, we need to be united, right, as believers. We need to be in agreement on the essential doctrine, expect, like salvation. I mean, that's pretty huge, right? And so, um, keep that in mind. Now, it's the second problem is Paul addresses is the need for help. The need for help. Lo- notice in verse 3, he says, And I urge you also, true companion, help these women who labored with me in the gospel, with Clement also and the rest of my fellow workers, whose names are in the book of life. Now, I'm not sure who this companion is, uh, but Clement may be uh, the Philippian jailer uh, there who was with Paul in Acts chapter 16 uh, we don't know but remember Paul was on probation in a sense right there in the Roman guardhouse as he's writing this letter to the church of Philippi and he's waiting a uh, trial or court if you will to to present himself before Nero uh, and he doesn't know if he's going to live or if he's going to die he has no clue and and I think the simple point for you and I as believers um, you know Paul understood that we needed peace, we needed unity, right? And he, he, uh, he had that assurance that there was other believers there in the church of Philippi who would do what he would do if he was there, but he couldn't be there. And so he knew that somebody would step it up and that they would go and bring peace and unity between these two that are bringing dissension and division and they're causing a dispute there and they need to, uh, there, there needs to be unity in that sense. And so uh, that's pretty neat that, that uh, Paul had somebody to come alongside him. And so, but realize as the church, we're all different. God has given us all different uh, gifts, if you will, right? And, and we, as the body of Christ, we all function uh, differently. But when we come together, we, we walk united, right? We walk the same and, and we function properly, if you will. But realize all of us have... Uh, a, a, a major role to play, if you will. You know, let me fast forward a little bit. Um, notice at the end of the verse right here, we, we're all in the book of life, right? As believers in Christ Jesus. We're in the book of life. The book of life is mentioned eight times in the New Testament. Seven times it's mentioned in Revelation. And those are cool if you guys look them up. It's a cool little study. But uh, it's, it's the book of uh, the book of life. It's the book of names of those believers who are who have given their lives to the Lord who have salvation right and those names every name in that book of life they're guaranteed eternal life with Christ Jesus and and so going back to the church though Paul turned to the church of Philippi you know to help him out since he was locked up and in Acts or I'm sorry 1 Corinthians 12 uh, verses 14 and on he's talking about the body you know the function of the body and there's many members we're all you know different but we we uh, we work together and and some of us are hands some of us are ears some of us are the feet some of us are the mouth and and realize you're needed 
for the rest of the body to function. You know, here at church, we got the children's ministry that does a great job. Um, we got all kinds of ministries. I could just keep going on and on. All the Bible studies throughout the week and, and the prayer that happens throughout the week is just, it's, it, it's amazing how the church functions. And who knew, you know, get a, a group of believers together and then all of a sudden someone just feels called. I, I just feel called to go with, take care of the two-year-olds right now. You know, the three-year-olds and the six-year-olds and you know, it's really cool. Not everybody has that same calling. And so all of us have different callings. Uh, but the thing is, don't covet what another has. Don't look at them and be like, I want that, right? I want to be like the, the guy playing the guitar. Or I want to, you know, we're, we're all different. God has enabled and equipped each and every one of you for a different task. And, and, and whatever that task may be is to glorify God in, right? And, and, uh, but we're all equipped differently. I can't do certain things that you guys can all do because you're all gifted in a different way. And so we're, you're all part of the family. And don't, don't, uh, um, uh, what was I was going to say, well, be content. Just be content, right? Whatever God's called you. And be content knowing that God's called you to whatever it is and, and glorify the Lord in it. Um, let's come to the third thing. The principle Paul gives. The principle Paul gives. Notice in verse 4, it says, and this is hard to say it without singing it, right? Rejoice in the Lord always. Again, I say rejoice. Do you guys know that song? I didn't hear anybody clap, so I guess not. No, not so much. Okay. I won't do that again. Um, but we understand that our joy is not based on our circumstances, right? Our joy is based on who Jesus Christ is, right? The person. Uh, because our circumstances, they always change. And our joy is in Jesus because he never changes. He says he, uh, he'll never leave us, he'll never forsake us in Hebrews and in Joshua 1, 9. And so uh, in, in the Bible, it says in Hebrews 13, 8, Jesus Christ is the same yesterday, today, and forever, right? And, and things change in our lives, but Jesus Christ, he never changes. He's consistent, and, and uh, he ne so we can always count on him. And I don't think verse 4, by the way, is by accident. Did you guys notice in verse 3, why are we rejoicing in the Lord always? Notice at the end of verse 3, it's because your name is in the book of life. I mean, I think that's reason enough to rejoice. Amen? Uh, remember when Jesus sent out the 70 disciples two by two in Luke chapter 10? You know, he sent them out. And, and uh, they came back to Jesus, and they're like, oh, they're all excited, right? And man, even the demons obeyed us. And he kind of rebuked them. He was like, don't, don't rejoice that the demons obeyed you, but rather rejoice that your names are written in heaven, right? So it's the same type of uh, meaning right here. Why, re why are you rejoicing, man? You just lost your house, and you lost your job, and you lost your car, and you know, your, your family was in that fire, and how are you rejoicing right now? Because my, my rejoicing is not in that stuff, right? My rejoicing is in Christ Jesus, right? And, and, and how can you do this? Or how, well, it's in Christ. It's not in the circumstance. And so uh, remember, it's all about Jesus, right? Let, let's come to the fourth thing here, is the patience Paul desires. Notice in verse 5, the patience Paul desires. Let your gentleness be known to all men. The Lord is at hand, it says. And by the way, this word gentleness uh, mentioned five times in the New Testament. Uh, really, patience is a better translation in the Greek uh, wording here. It speaks of forbearance, long-suffering. So it, it, it can say in the, in, the, in the literal Greek here, let your patience or your long-suffering uh, be known to all men. Uh, according to 2 Peter chapter 3, verse 9, it says, the Lord is not slack concerning his promise, as some count slackness, but is long-suffering toward us, not willing that any should perish, but that all should come to repentance. But notice he is long-suffering toward us. And that's the same idea here. The point is, you and I are to be patient. You and I are to be long-suffering uh, and gentle, even to those who mistreat us or speak bad to us. Amen? Amen. <laughs> yes. <laughs> what, what's going to happen when you're patient with these people, right? Because 
Because these are that type of people that you need to be patient with, right? Those are the ones where you're like, Lord, I'd never pray to you about these, right? But this person, I really need your patience. But when you're patient with them, they're going to see, when you're long-suffering with them, they're going to see Christ in you. And that's what it's all about, right? That's what we're here for. And, and it's not tough. It's not difficult. It's not hard. It's impossible. <laughs> you can't be patient in and of yourself and in your flesh, right? It's a supernatural work that only Christ can do in and through your life. And as you're flexible, right, as you allow him to work his patience in and through your life. So how do you be gentle with all men? Well, by understanding this simple principle at the end of verse 5, notice it says the Lord is at hand. He is He's here right now to enable you, us, right, to strengthen us, to equip you and I uh, to have this gentleness before all men. And it has to be a work of the Spirit in and through us. The Bible says in Philippians 2.13, it says, For it is God who works in you both to will and to do for his good pleasure. And the Bible also says in 1 Peter 2.11, for to this you were called, because Christ also suffered for us, leaving us an example that you should follow his steps. Amen? You guys, slow on that one. Um, but notice, by the way, the, the, the wording right here. It says, the Lord uh, at hand, because that word is is in italics it's not there so it says the lord at hand and so uh when you guys have, have you ever said it before right I really i can't stand this person anymore right um we we can't but since the lord is in us you you can he enables us to be patient with others and when we are there's peace that comes from that uh, because we understand that the Lord is here. He's here, to, he's here to do a work in and through our lives. So number five, uh, the prayer Paul seeks. The prayer Paul seeks. Uh, notice in verse six, there's two commands that are given to us in verse six. Uh, the first is, uh, it says, be anxious for nothing, but in everything by prayer and supplication with thanksgiving, let your request be made known to God. So be anxious for nothing, for nada, right? And by the way, this is a command given to us as believers. Uh, turn with me to Matthew, Matthew chapter 6, please, if you will. Matthew chapter 6. Don't be troubled or worried about the cares of today. Happiness is based on circumstances, right? That's where we get our old English uh, uh, wording there for happy stance. So you're happy because of the circumstance. But our joy doesn't come from circumstances. It comes from the person and the work of Jesus Christ. And, and the problem is we begin to think about tomorrow and we begin to be, get consumed and we begin to uh, become worried. And, and uh, people will watch the news and they're like, oh, this week the U.S. military is going to be doing drills, assimilated live drills on an EMP attack. What if Korea gets really mad and North Korea you know, throws an EMP at us because we're practicing that? Oh, the lights are all going to go out and oh, right? We get an anxious anxiety rises and they're getting all crazy and heart all right ah oh, heart attack and i'm gonna die that's what happens with a lot of people in the world today but being worried immobilizes us as believers now genuine concern spurs us to action so there's the difference right but worrying immobilizes us emotionally physically spiritually in fact worrying is actually a sin I don't know if you guys realize that, but it is. It's a sin. You're in sin, and some people love sinning by worrying, right? A lot of worriers and not warriors, right? Um, but Jesus told us, and if you're in Matthew chapter 6, look at verse 25. It says in verse 25, Therefore, I say to you, Jesus says, do not worry about your life, what you'll eat or what you'll drink, nor about your body, what you'll put on. Is not life more than food and the body more than clothing? Look at the birds of the air, for they neither sow nor reap nor gather into barns, yet your heavenly Father feeds them. Are you not more value than they? Which of you, by worrying, can add one cubit to his stature? 
Nobody's raising their hand. Nope, none of us. So why do you worry about clothing? Consider the lilies of the field, how they grow. They neither toil nor spin. And yet I say to you that even Solomon in all his glory was not arrayed like one of these. Now if God so clothed the grass of the field, which today is and tomorrow is thrown into the oven, will he not much more clothe you, O you of little faith? Therefore, do not worry. That's a command saying, what shall we eat? Or what shall we drink? Or what shall we wear? For after all these things, the Gentiles seek. For your heavenly Father knows that you need all these things. But seek first the kingdom of God and his righteousness. Notice not your righteousness, but your own good works. Wink, wink, right? Uh, And all these things shall be added to you. Therefore, do not worry about tomorrow. For tomorrow will worry about its own things. Sufficient uh, is the day for its own trouble, right? So when we come to that place, that position in our lives, uh, when we're not worried about tomorrow, what we'll eat or what we'll drink or what we'll wear, right? Um, In effect, what we're saying is, God, I I totally trust you. I I trust in you. I, I, I believe that you are in control, you know what you're doing, you're either allowing it to happen or you're making it happen, and I'm just going to trust in you, and I'm going to acknowledge you, I'm going to thank you, uh, because I recognize that you know what you're doing more so than I know what I'm doing. And, and, and guess what? God's going to direct your path because you're trusting in him, you're acknowledging him. And, and uh, let's go to the second command here. In the end of verse 6, notice, let your request be made known to God. And don't worry about everything, but pray about everything, right? Paul outlines for us three requests, uh, three ways that we can make our requests known to God. Notice in verse 6, the first is uh, adoration. Adoration, that's prayer, uh, and, and it's used 37 times in the New Testament, and it simply means to talk to God, right? To worship God, to fellowship with God. And, and when you're feeling worried, simply come to Jesus and just talk to him. And, and he's always waiting there with open arms and open ears to hear you, uh, when you when you're talking to him. He desires to hear from us all the time. I love it when my children, my daughter comes up to me and she, she could talk. But I love it when my, my son comes, right? Because he doesn't talk. But when he does talk, I'm like, oh, keep talking. What is it? Oh, it's so great. I just, I love it. It's the best, right? And so I pause whatever I'm doing. I'm like, what happened? And I'll say it on purpose so that they can repeat themselves. And I'm like, oh, all right. And I can imagine like how God is with us when we come before his throne, right? And we, by his grace, right, we were able to do that. And, and we just start talking to the Lord. He's like, oh, yeah, what happened, right? He delights more than you realize, and you're just like, right? whatever it may be. Uh, but as you're doing that, your worrying and your doubt is just draining from you, and it's gone. Because the more you're talking to the Lord, you're putting your confidence and trust in the Lord. And it's pretty cool. But our problem is, you know, what do we do? We pick up the phone. We talk to three of our friends. We start Facebook grouping everybody and hear Twitter and, you know, and we do all this stuff. And then Instagram this. And, and, uh, and then all of a sudden, what's our last resort? Uh, I think I'll, I should pray about this. Yeah, I think I'll do that. That's our problem. You know, uh, just, just worship him and pray to him. And that's all the church needs today, right? Uh, it's like the old song that we sing, right? Oh, oh, what peace we often forfeit. Oh, what needless pain we bear. All because we do not carry, right? Everything to God in prayer. Yeah, sorry, I did it again, yeah. Yeah. Um, The second, let's come to the second thing is uh, supplication. Notice in verse 6, supplication. Uh, It's used 19 times in the Bible in the New Testament. It means to request, to ask, to petition. And, And you can petition before God on behalf of yourself or on behalf of others. And James said, hey, we, we don't have because we don't ask, you know, and, and simply asking God for his help, for his direction, uh, for his advice, for his comfort. Uh, those are all good things to ask for, right? When you ask of the Lord, it shows, it shows your need for him, that you are nothing without him it shows that he is high and lifted uh, uh, he's majestic right he's he's uh, he's holy and he's above you 
Um, and that's what prayer does, right? It, it shows your submission to the Lord. And so let's come to the third thing here at the end of verse 6. And that's appreciation. Thanksgiving, right? Appreciation. And, and we're to constantly be giving thanks to the Lord. And, and so go to the Lord and request through adoration, supplication, and uh, appreciation. Giving thanks to the Lord in every situation that you find yourself in. Why? When you're, when you're thankful to God, you're actually in the will of God. The Bible says in 1 Thessalonians 5.18... In everything, give thanks, for this is the will of God in Christ Jesus for you. Now, some of you guys translate that in some things, right? Give thanks to the Lord, for this is God's will for you. But that's not what the Bible actually says. Um, but if you want to be in the center of God's will for you, then be thankful unto the Lord, right? Thank him for everything in your relationship problems, your financial problems, and your spiritual problems. I don't know, all your problems, right? It's tough. It's hard. Yep, I know. It's impossible, right? It's, it's, it, you, can't, in and of, you can't produce this fruit in your life in and of yourself, of your own flesh. It's a supernatural work that only Christ can do in and through your life. And so uh, your flesh wants to yell at God and say, you know, why did this happen to me? And God's like, why not? <laughs> I, I could do it. I'm God. I'm your creator. You know, you're the created. God could do whatever he wants to do. And, and so it's not your love, but it's that supernatural love in and through your life that, that God is doing uh, in, in, uh, in producing through your life. So the only way you can be thankful unto the Lord, we know, is by his grace. You know, the Bible's very clear. 2 Corinthians 4.15. So when suffering comes or death comes, um, now you can say thank you to the Lord because of his grace, right? And, and let's come to the sixth thing. I think I'm going to break a record here and end too short. Maybe we should just start reading for fun, huh? We'll read a couple chapters to buy time. But let's go to the sixth thing here. The peace Paul brings, or promises, the peace Paul promises. Notice in verse 7. And the peace of God, which surpasses all understanding, will guard your hearts and minds through Christ Jesus. See, when you cast all your cares at his feet, knowing that he cares for you, the promise that is that of peace. And, and no man can comprehend this peace. We don't understand it, but we rest in it, right? And realize God is either orchestrating this thing in your life, or, or he, but he is orchestrating, whether he's allowing it or making it happen. He's, he's the one who's orchestrating it. He's putting it into play into your life. So notice this peace is only through Jesus Christ, right? We think, you know, maybe that new job, maybe that new house, maybe that new spouse, maybe that, hey, watch it, right? Um, then everything's going to be okay for me, and it's going to be great. No, it's not, right? But true peace is in the person and the work of Jesus Christ. It's, it's him. It's Ephesians 2.14. It says, for he himself, speaking of Jesus, is our peace, who has made both one and has broken down the middle wall of separation. So you don't have to ask for peace because he's already in you. But if you're like me, I still ask, and I don't know why. I'm still like, Lord, I just want your peace, Lord, and be for them and your peace. And, and, uh, but the Bible is very clear. If he's in you, he is your peace. And in fact, the Bible says in John 14, 27, Jesus is talking to his disciples here. And he says, he says, peace I leave with you, my peace I give to you, not as the world gives do I give you. Uh, let not your heart be troubled, neither let it be afraid. So we all have problems, but not everyone has peace in their problems. If you're a believer, you do, uh, which is a cool benefit, right? Um, so, amen. amen. Thanks. I didn't even have to say that. Good job, guys. So the seventh thing is uh, the priorities Paul proclaims. The priorities Paul proclaims. Notice in verse 8. Uh, and these are good verses. You guys memorize these verses? If you want to memorize some verses, here's the big chunk right here. This whole passage that we've been going over. It's really, really good. Uh, verse 8. Finally, brethren, uh, whatever things are true, whatever things are noble, whatever things are just, whatever things are pure, whatever things are lovely, whatever things are of good report, 
if there's any virtue and if there is anything praiseworthy, then meditate on these things. Our priorities are, we're, we're all messed up. We have the tendency in putting, you know, worldly stuff before spiritual stuff. And, and uh, by the way, notice this word right here in verse 8, uh, the word if. It's in the first class condition in the Greek. So it means since these things uh, are true, meditate on these things, right? So a lot of times I believe we're on the edge or have unrest in our lives. It's because we're not meditating on the right things. Uh, we need to be careful with the things that influence our, our, uh, our thoughts. Uh, you know, the books that we read, um, the movies that we watch, the people we hang out with, the sites that we visit. We got to be watchful in all things because you're allowing these things to pop up. And, and what we put into our minds is eventually going to manifest itself in our actions. And so, you know, are you on it easy? Uh, do you have a lack of peace in your life? Do you feel like you deserve more? Uh, it might be because you're meditating on the wrong things. Are you looking at a, that other person outside of your marriage, right? It's, you're not content with what God has given you. And God has given you enough He's given you, what he's given you is sufficient for the day, right? <clears throat> so daily we need to look to the Lord and trust in the Lord. But the more you choose to go out into the world and act like your old self, which you're not anymore, well, first of all, you got the Holy Spirit convicting you and you got a lot going against you there. And it's really, really hard to try to live again like the world. But you keep forcing yourself and forcing yourself, then you open up your mind to these things and you wonder why. Why am I doing all this stuff? Doctor, I need your help. And he's like, here's a whole bunch of depressants for you. Here you go. And I'm making some cash off of you because you don't know how to captivate your mind there and, you know, take your thoughts captive. But if you're a believer, man, what a tragedy that is, right? That believers don't even know how to captivate their own mind and, and say, whoa, where'd that come from? I need, to, I need to look at the word right now. I need to dwell on not what's not true, but rather what's true, what's noble, what's praiseworthy, what's a good report, right? I need to think on these things. And as Christians, we need to be, we need to be watchful. I think, I think uh, man, probably... 90% of counseling would be taken care of if everybody learned how to discipline their mind according to the word of God, right? By using the word of God, uh, you would skip so much drama in your life, right? Because all this communication problems that you have with other people, probably because you think yourself more highly than you ought to think, right? You're not preferring others above yourself. You're not... Uh, uh, blessing those around you, but rather you're placing yourself as numero uno, right? And uh, we got to be cautious. We got to be watchful for that. So let's end with verse eight before you guys kill me here. Um, it says, or the promise Paul makes, the promise Paul makes, and that's in verse nine. It says, the things which you learned and received and heard and saw in me, Paul says, these do, and the God of peace will be with you. Now, this is what the world needs more than anything else, right? The world needs God's peace. And once you make peace with God, then and only then uh, will you receive peace from God. And, and you need to be reconciled with God since you're conceived in sin, right? The only, this only comes by a relationship with Jesus Christ, right? You can't have that peace of God that we're talking about if you don't even know God, right? So doesn't work that way. We need to confess our sins before him. And in fact, the Bible says in Ephesians 1.11, in him also we have obtained an inheritance being predestined according to the purpose of him who works all things, not some things, but all things according to the counsel of his will. And I rest on that. You talk about resting on the promises of God's word. God, how am I going to do this? How am I going to do that? Well, why don't you get out of the way and just recognize that I'm doing it and I have a plan and it's according to my counsel and my will and I want to use you, right? Are you willing and able to be flexible in that area? So question your own heart. Have you made peace with God? You know, make time to come before the Lord uh, tonight and, and take that time and, and just, 
get away, right? And just stop and make your peace with the Lord and talk to the Lord. If you don't know the Lord, invite the Lord in your heart. If you do know the Lord, then confess your sins because we know that he doesn't hear the prayers of those that are in sin, right? If you're rejoicing in your iniquity instead of rejoicing in the Lord and you're, you're, you're taking more pleasure in, in uh, the, the worldly things and the lust of the, the world and the flesh, then it's going to hinder your prayers unto the Lord and you're wondering, why, why, Lord, I talked to you about all these things. How come you're not doing it, right? <laughs> Oh, maybe because you need to repent, right, sinner? <laughs> uh, turn to the Lord and, 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 and then watch and see the floodgates of heaven just push, you know, and, and his grace abounds, right, much more in the humble, not in the proud. So um, I could just keep going, but I don't want to just keep going. So you guys mind if we quit tonight? Just kind of calm down. We could keep going afterward if you want, but... Let's pray, guys. Father, thank you so much for your word, and uh, thank you that uh, you are able, uh, Lord, to do this work in and through our lives, and we pray uh, that you would uh, continue to be that peace in our lives. May it be so evident and apparent, Lord, in our lives. As the world sees us, may they see you, Father, and I pray that you would grant us that patience uh, that is because of your love, Lord, because you're in our lives, um, you're able to produce uh, that just natural byproduct of love. And I pray, Lord, that you would keep us content uh, on the things that you've given us, Lord, and really content on just knowing you is enough, Lord. And I, I picture those who are in hell uh, who don't know you, and, and uh, they wish, Lord, that they can be in our position right now, that they can live and breathe here in this world and have that freedom of choice and, and to be able to grow in you and to know you. And yet, uh, we as believers, Lord, we're... we're uh, we're just caught up in our own world, and, and uh, we act like everything's okay. And I, I pray that we would just take heed uh, to those around us who, who would desire our, our, posi our position and our, our, uh, our stance right now. And so I pray that every breath that we take, Lord, would be edifying to you. I pray that uh, every action we do uh, would bring you that glory and that honor and that praise, Lord. And our, our lips would just truly just utter uh, your word. And I pray that you would uh, keep our minds stayed on you, Lord, that we would meditate on your word, uh, whatever is true, just, pure, uh, praiseworthy, of good report. Lord, help us to continue to look to you in all things. And I pray that you uh, would use us, Lord, as the church to, to um, bring edification, Father, bring unity in our church. I pray that you would uh, remove anybody here that might be uh, just having that heart of dissension, that wants to just bring the division, uh, Lord, that you would uh, bring us to come alongside them, to, to aid them in that area uh, by presenting your word. Uh, but if they are here just to, to still kill and destroy, Lord, then I pray that you would uh, remove them and that you would have your way with us, Father, as a church. We're growing, Lord, as a church in, in maturity before your word, and uh, our hearts are, are growing, Lord. And I just thank you for the work you're doing, and I pray that you'd be with our pastor and that you bring him back safely and, and the whole team, Lord, and that they would be uh, in good health and keep them from the sickness. And uh, we just thank you for the work that you're doing, Lord, in Jesus' name. Amen.